I, and you got to be kidding me. It's, it's 2019. We barely have enough people and time to do the job. And, and the job at the absolute minimum is training and responding. And now you're going to ask members to come on board and knock on doors and, and, and go door to door and, and stand in the street with boots. It's ridiculous. Enchanted Sky Media. Media. From the Enchanted Sky Studios in Prescott, Arizona, this is Code 3, the Firefighters Podcast, hosted by award-winning journalist Scott Orr. Code 3 features interviews with leading members of the fire service, discussing firefighting strategies, tactics, and other topics you need to know more about. Now, here's Scott. That's right, and I will not let Parkinson stop me. Thank you for joining me again on another edition of Code 3. You are listening to the show for and about firefighters. Let's get started. Volunteer firefighters make up most U.S. departments by far. Yet the state of volunteer firefighting in this country is in serious trouble. The NFPA issued a report in March that said there were 46,000 fewer volunteers in 2017 than a year earlier. There just aren't enough people willing or able to volunteer to answer emergency calls anymore. And it's not just limited to rural areas. Response times are going up and the number of people responding keeps falling. It's past time to start finding solutions. Here to discuss that is Billy Goldfeder. He's a deputy chief of the Loveland Sims, Ohio Fire Department. He's a prolific writer for several fire service magazines. Billy's a member of the board of directors of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, the September 11th Families Association of New York, and the International Association of Fire Chiefs. You can find him at firefightercloscalls.com. Billy Goldfeder, welcome to Code 3. Pleasure to be here. Thanks uh, for taking the time to chat. So does the public really understand the lack of staffing in a typical volunteer fire department? Well, I'm not sure I'm not sure the public understands staffing in any fire departments. I think that, you know, honestly, when they see TV shows or when they read children's books, typically there's firefighters all over the apparatus and all over the scene and unfortunately, it's not always reality. Specifically in volunteer fire departments, what we're seeing across the nation, and there's different theories about why this is happening, but we're seeing less and less turnout, less and less response, and less and less interest. And this is not by any stretch of the imagination any slam on a volunteer fire department. There are many volunteer fire departments that are succeeding and doing well, and most of them have adjusted how they operate. In other words, let's say they were formed 50, 75 years ago. And that was you know, when there was an alarm uh, you know, maybe once a week, if that and uh, were an emergency once a week. But that's when most people lived in their communities, worked in their communities, and life was a lot simpler back then. You know, you'd come home from work, you'd read the newspaper, and if you had a TV, you'd watch it or listen to the radio, and you'd go to bed. I mean, that was pretty much life, but it was all centered around the community, centered around your home. Today, that's just not the case. So what some of the most successful volunteer fire departments today have done is that they've match their organization to the needs of the community, which is exactly what they did years ago when they were founded. In other words, we have fires. We don't have a nearby fire department or fire company, so we formed one. Uh, Unfortunately, you know, the way they operated back then with, you know, once in a while having a little bit of training, uh, once in a while there was a run, uh, that's changed uh, substantially. Uh, And So in order to come from home or come from work, when you're doing 1,000 or 1,500 runs a year or even a couple hundred, just may not be a reality anymore. Is the lack of volunteers worse than most departments will admit to the public? Oh, I I think so. I don't think that they're being honest. I don't think that they're going to, and and again, I don't want to broad brush this. This is my opinion, uh, obviously, of what I'm seeing. But I think on average, 
in areas that are, are relatively heavily populated or, or even, you know, suburban areas, uh, they're not. Um, the tones are going off more and more. Uh, they may or may not respond. Uh, I have I have countless examples uh, of, of fire departments. I mean, I'm aware of one station uh, that 50% of the time they fail to get a truck on the road. And no one's screaming about that. And, and the screaming wouldn't come from the public because they wouldn't realize that unless something critical occurred. But the screaming has to come internally from the bosses, the commissioners, the chiefs, the city council, the village trustees, to understand that this is a real problem. And there's nothing wrong uh, with admitting, say, hey, we, we need a change here. We need bunk rooms. We need stipends. We need uh, – uh, in-house uniform funding, or we need to hire people, and that's a, you know that's not the end of the world. It may be the end of someone's individual personal world of what they like or what they don't like. But again, if it's ten o'clock on a Tuesday morning or midnight on a Friday night, and there's a house fire, what in reality is the re- response going to be? And you know the answer. Everybody knows the answer. Uh, you know whether it's a good answer or a bad answer. They have to face that and deal with it. A volunteer fire department on a regular basis should be reporting the good, the bad, the ugly, and the community has an obligation to support whatever suggestions are being made to fix the problem. I've always found that if we use it a, a sort of a, a, a test, you know, what's best for the public and then what's best for the members, we're going to usually figure out uh, what's best and how we need to be operating. So then I would assume you think volunteer departments should be proactive so that if they are hemorrhaging members, they should have a duty to tell their community they may have to cut services or the response times may be longer. Sure, absolutely. Hey, this, this is, you know, this is what they're there. They're there to serve the public. So then there's the answer to that is, yes, you need to let them know, give them reports and say, hey, you know, that uh, the evenings we do well. We can get trucks out. We've got crews. People are around and we're fine. But during the day, we do not have the ability to get our trucks out in, in a timely manner. And we need assistance. You know, one, one of the problems also is that so many volunteer fire departments receive little to no funding from the public. They have, the, you know, no, no automatic tax funding. They do uh, pizza sales, turkey sales, uh, roadside boot drives, fun drives. And, and you got to be kidding me. It's, it's 2019. We barely have enough people and time to do the job. And, and the job at the absolute minimum is training and responding. And now you're going to ask members to come on board and knock on doors and go door to door and stand in the street with boots. It's ridiculous. You don't see the public works people doing that. You don't see the cops doing that. And I understand traditionally uh, the volunteer fire department want to be independent and, and, and fund themselves and all that. But that's not reality. There's, as you've said, and as you've asked, there really has to be an honest, no nonsense clear view of exactly what is expected and what a volunteer fire department can do and what they can't do. And that needs to be shared with the local governing body, the public, and and say, hey, we want to continue to exist. We want to continue to serve. But here's what our needs are right now. Well, you know, in the interest of realism, not negativity, I don't necessarily think that that sort of a concept of taxing would go over well, even though it's needed. I think because people are just like anything else, people are used to getting fire service for free, that if you suddenly say, hey, we've got to start taxing you, they're going to be up in arms. The other thing that goes with that is that, and again, this is my opinion of how people react, I believe they'll say it's some sort of an excuse. You know, they don't realize that they, that their fire department isn't receiving money currently except through the turkey sales. Yeah, so that that's all about honesty and then full disclosure. Uh, you know, you, we can't just say, "Hey, we're starting a tax next week." There has to be a good public education program, but there, honestly, there has to be a plan. Set up a a group that includes uh, uh, taxpayers, uh, that includes members of the fire department, that includes members of the local governing body, and sit around and and around the table and come up with a plan and figure out how we're going to do this. 
And I mean, I think when it comes down to, and I understand people and taxes and all that, but fire and rescue is one of the few taxes that you actually can see where your service is coming from compared to sometimes, you know, the money going to Washington and even local government. We pay so much money, but yet our roads are still screwed up and, and, and bridges are still needing a repair and, you know, all those sort of things. But I think, you know, and I'm not talking about money coming out of a general fund. I'm not always a fan of that. I think some of the most successful fire departments, fire districts, and fire companies are ones that have their own tax base, whether it's a tax levy or whatever, because then we can show you exactly. Look, you gave us a million bucks last year, and we're going to show you to the penny exactly where that is. And that includes the, the pride we have in you know, getting anywhere in the district in six minutes or, or uh, we're always turning out with eight people or you know whatever the case may be. But at some point, the, the taxpayers have to decide what they want. And if the taxpayers are okay with very slow response times, low staffing, uh, and a fire department that pretty much just comes and puts down the exposures, uh, then that's fine with me. You know, that's, that, I got no problem with that. And I think sometimes if you choose to live in an area out in the middle of nowhere and you expect anything more than, 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 than a couple of people showing up with a tanker, you're, you're kind of fooling yourselves. But it's, it's incumbent upon the public to also understand what their fire department can do and cannot do. But, yeah, turning it back around to what you said, we have an obligation to let them know. And if you're a fire department who's, who pretty much has little to no communication with the public, is not sharing what's going on with the public, is struggling funding-wise, struggling people-wise, you're in deep trouble. But it's never too late to start out a plan. And again, I think if you get, you know, reach out to perhaps the most radical anti-tax group in your community, maybe, and tell talk to them. I don't, I'm not aware of those groups being against tax. I think they're against paying money and getting nothing and seeing governments waste money and just, you know, piss things away. I was watching something yesterday uh, when uh, the 9-11 uh, folks went to meet with Mitch McConnell uh, to try and get funding for the 9-11 Victims Fund. And it was reminded that the chair he sits in, the building he is in, the clothes he wears are paid for by taxpayers. So a lot of times, in, in, in many, many cases, local government forgets that. Federal government certainly forgets that. And I think we as, as firefighters have an obligation to when we do receive money, and it, it may be a turkey dinner, it may be uh, taxes, it's still money given to us to provide a service. We can't piss that away. And we, be, we need to be able to justify every nickel and how we spend it and how we spend it in taking care of the firefighters so they're able to provide service to the community. So looking at operations then, what's the tipping point? When does a volunteer department become dangerously ineffective? So I think that they already know it. Um, and you look at you, your you mean You mean if they are, they already realize it? Uh, I think their heads are in the sand in many areas. But the tipping point to me is the first time you realize that you don't have people around during a certain period of time, whether it be day or night. And you know it right now. Any department right now will be able to tell you who's around typically, what the stats look like, you know, Will you be able to get your trucks out in two or three minutes, or is it going to take 15, 20 minutes? Will you get able-bodied firefighters showing up, or will we be getting you know, one or two you know, great folks who are retired, but they're not interior firefighters? Those answers are out there. And, but the tipping point are based upon your statistics. What we, we all know our stats. Go back and look at the last five years. Do a real in-depth analysis and identify what, your staffing is, who the staffing is, and what the times look like. And as soon as you identify that there's a problem, in other words, public comes up to you and says, can you guarantee me a first alarm assignment of, uh, you know, 15, 20 firefighters to my home in, in eight to 10 minutes? And the answer is either yes or no. It's not a homina homina. We, the answer is there. We know what we can do, what we can't. If we're in a position where we are that shorthanded and we don't have a tax, taxing authority at the at this point, is it better to shut down a department that lacks staff and rely on even longer response times from nearby agencies? Or is it better to try to keep it on life support? I think it's better to keep it on life support and decide what we can and cannot do. 
if your daytime response or just say your response is typically good folks, but they're not interior qualified, uh, we need to let the public know that. Let them know that we're working on a plan to come up with a tax or whatever it's going to be, or we're going to do recruitment or whatever it is, and make sure they understand that they're going to be able to respond, but they're going to respond with a couple of folks who's probably going to be operating a deck gun or a hose stream to protect exposures, but we may not be able to go inside. That's kind of a big deal, but I think keeping it on, I think, I think any response of people that have some level of training is better than no response at all. Uh, now, that additional help should be on its way on the initial alarm, but if you've got people who are capable of flowing water, capable of pulling a line, even if it's uh, you know two or three people understanding that we cannot be interior, we'd love to be, we just can't, and uh, we're going to do all we can. We're going to size it up. We're going to get on the radio and advise what else we may need. But I think initial response is better than no response. You know, you mentioned rural areas and how living out there should automatically imply to people that they're not going to get full fire coverage because of where they've chosen to live. But what about these volunteer agencies in suburban areas? If they do, in fact, arrive with two or three people, maybe they're not interior qualified, maybe there's not enough to send them inside. Uh, how, what does that say to the homeowner who is expecting fire coverage but is only getting exposure coverage? Yeah, so that, that, that's a great point. And, and we're, we're, again, we're fooling the public, and they should, nobody likes surprises uh, other than good surprises, right? And, I mean, if you work for a fire chief, I'm sure you've heard from your chief, don't give me any surprises. If there's any problems, let me know ahead of time. And, and you know, be be communicative and, and let me know what's going on. Well, we have the same obligation to the public. And I don't care if you're a private nonprofit volunteer fire company. You're in the business of being in, in, the, in the fire service. People say, oh, that's none of their business what we're doing. And so, well, it absolutely is. You got a garage. It says fire department on it. The public doesn't care whether you're a private fire company or fire district or whatever. And I'm not talking about a private for-profit. I'm talking about, like, for example, in the state of Delaware, all but the city of Wilmington, every fire department in the state of Delaware are private nonprofit corporations. The, you know, the so-and-so fire department incorporated. Well, that's a business who's contracted or agreed to, and I'm not just picking on Delaware, I'll just give you an example, but any, any fire department is a business who has agreed to provide service, and we've implied the service by having fire trucks by having garage doors that say fire department on them and racing, you know, to emergencies when we're able to. So there's, there's that unwritten agreement and unwritten contract that we have, we are going to provide service and, and, and gang, it, it's just a matter of letting them know what you can and cannot do. And, and I just, I, I do get the personal pride, but pride is only valid when you have something to be proud of. Uh, you may be proud of your organization's past, but if you're not proud of the current and you're worried about the future, now is the time to take action and starts with open and honest communication. Here's the problem. Here's what we, we can and cannot do. And our solution is we're setting up a task force that consists of a few members of the public, a few elected officials, and, and, or, and leadership from our fire department. And we're going to come up with some solutions and options. And we may come up with an A, B, and a C plan. The A plan gives the public first-class, top-notch, meeting all standards, fire service, whatever that's going to cost. The B plan is we're going to give you pretty good fire service. And in most cases, we'll get there pretty quick. And in most cases, we'll do pretty well. And the C plan is what you're getting now. So the public, and this is the cost to that. So the public would have then an opportunity to vote on what they want. And what the public wants is then what we deliver. I mean, it's kind of a pretty simple model to me. Uh, is, it, is it heartache? Is it go against the grain in our pride of our organizations? Sure, but we can't have false pride. What many departments are starting to look at is duty crews. And that's a, that's a real paradigm shift. That's a big deal for the volunteer that was, you know, and much more comfortable sleeping at home, being at work, uh, doing the sort of things that they do. And now we're saying to you, hey, we'd like you to stay at the firehouse, you know, one day a week or one day every two weeks or one evening or what have you. 
So that, but we have to kind of focus on what's going to be best for the fire department uh, as far as they're serving the community. Now, the plus side of that is, you know, in typical volunteer fire departments, maybe a, a small percentage of the members are the most active, making most of the runs. So while right now those people are getting up and out of bed for every single run, they're not going to have to do that anymore. They can stay home, stay asleep, and set their pager on an all-call tone or something like that. And then the duty crew in quarters will handle the day-to-day -day bread and butter runs. Certainly you get a building fire or a critical crash, you know, you want more staffing, you, you set a different tone off or whatever. That's all configurable stuff. But this way, the same people are not getting out of bed every night for the same runs, uh, and it kind of spreads the wealth a little bit, and it allows those who may not be as active to either make a decision. Uh, you're going to be involved in the fire department. You're going to do your duty crew, or you're not. That also allows us to apply training at the same time, so it's one less reason to have to be at the firehouse. So it's really all about changing uh, how we operate uh, at little to no cost. Keep that in mind. This isn't costing anything. It's just readjusting how we operate. And if we're truly focused and dedicated to the needs of the community, we really have to give a serious look to that. Other solutions are automatic mutual aid. This is not just about one fire department. This is about regions of numerous volunteer fire departments where in some areas they still refuse to have an automatic aid program. Uh, no, we'll handle it ourselves till we get there and decide what we need. That, that's absolutely inappropriate. Look at the, the, the fact that if you know for the last couple of years you're only getting four or five people out on a first alarm assignment, then why wouldn't you want to reach out to your neighbors and come up with a program where you assist them and they assist you? But at some point, that well can run dry as well. And, and it can't be what I call mutual aid. We can't be moochers. We can't constantly call one town for help, but yet we're unable to get help to them. If that's the case and we're in that bad of trouble, then we've got to come up with some other solutions, which often is hiring people to solve the problem. All right, we'll leave it there, Billy Oldfeather. Thanks for being on Code 3 today. A pleasure to be here, and thanks for the great work you're doing. You're helping get the message out to many people who may not have the opportunity to hear kind of what's going on out there. Take care of yourself, and thank you again. And we put some more information about volunteer department problems on our website at code3podcast.com slash trouble. Check it out. All right, that's it. That's all for this edition of Code 3. This time we talked about the dangerous staffing levels of volunteer departments. Do you have solutions that are working? Ideas you're trying? I'd like to know. Just email me, scott at code3podcast.com, or leave a voicemail at 562-337-9902. Thank you for listening today. I'll be back next time with more, and I hope you'll be here. I'm Scott Orr, and until then, stay safe. Code 3 is a production of Enchanted Sky Media. To contact us, get more information on today's topic, or subscribe to the podcast, go to Code3Podcast.com.